just posterior and somewhat lateral to the maxillary bones that extends up here, forming just the very medial aspects of the inside of the orbit, is a small bone called the lacrimal bone. So here it is on the right side, likewise here it is on the left side. It's a very thin bone. In fact, some of the skull preparations that are real bone that might even be broken from it being handled by a number of generations of students. But you will notice that within that lacrimal bone, there's an opening that I'm putting the probe into. This opening is a nasal lacrimal duct that is discussed when we study the anatomy of the eye, and it serves as the passageway for drainage of the tears down into the inside of that nasal cavity. Could you lift the skull cook so they could see that? Right. And put so the probe the in it? Yeah, turn it sideways just a little bit. There we go. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Okay, so that was the nasal lacrimal duct, which is a term I don't believe is on your objective sheet, but it is something that is mentioned when we study the eyes. When you go over towards the lateral aspect, the bones that form the real prominence of your cheek is zygomatic bone, and all this area and through here. This is all zygomatic bone in this area here. Okay. Now, two bones that probably cause the most difficulty is the sphenoid bone and the ethmoid bone. Let's consider the ethmoid bone first of all. It's a very complex bone and its appearance varies depending upon what directional view that you're seeing. If you were to look into the nasal cavity from an anterior view, then most of the bony structure that you're seeing is ethmoid bone. So I want to just point this out. For example, the bony portion of the nasal septum is the is ethmoid bone. And likewise, the lateral walls of the nasal cavity is ethmoid bone. Unless you're looking at the lateral wall down here at the inferior aspect, which is more maxillary bone. But if you stay more in a superior direction, then the lateral walls is also ethmoid bone. And you'll notice that projecting out of the sides, out of the lateral sides of the nasal cavity, are some bony shelf like projections. These are called concha, which are part of the ethmoid bone. They're also part of the maxillary bone as well, too. Now, since the ethmoid bone is forming part of the lateral walls, then if we could go to the other side of where I'm touching with the probe, like what I'm doing with my thumb, then we'd be looking at the medial surface of the orbit. And if I do it again with my index finger, then now I'm on the other lateral side of the ethmoid bone. So as long as I stay posterior to the lacrimal bone, then I've also got my fingers over the lateral walls of the ethmoid bone. And where I've got my fingers and thumb is really just the other side of the ethmoid bone that I was showing you here on the inside of the nasal cavity. We also have a view of the ethmoid bone if you look at the floor of the cranial cavity. So looking at this floor of the cranial cavity, you are also now looking at the roof of the ethmoid bone. And so this area that is visible between my fingers is ethmoid bone. This is actually the superior aspect of the ethmoid bone. So if I put my finger there for a landmark and then turn the skull around and have you look back up into the nasal cavity again, then the roof of that nasal cavity that you're looking at is ethmoid bone. My finger's on the other side. So the roof of the, nas of the ethmoid bone is also forming part of the floor of the of the cranial cavity. Because of this situation, then an, a strong upward blow to the nose may be very dangerous in fracturing that ethmoid bone and causing pieces of the ethmoid bone to be driven up into the brain there. And this is quite critical also because you'll see that a little spike portion of the ethmoid bone that is extending up, and I'm clicking here with my fingernail, that is the crista golly. And then if you look on either side of the crista golly, then this flattened area of the ethmoid bone is called the cribiform plate. If you examine this on a real skull, the bone is perforated by a number of openings, giving the appearance of a cribbage board, if you're familiar with the card being cribbage. And passing through those openings are the nerve fibers of the olfactory nerve coming from the inside of the nasal cavity and conducting nerve impulses from the organs for smell up into your brain. If you go lateral to the ethmoid bone, considering the floor of the cranial cavity, then this is more of the frontal bone. This is more of the frontal bone. 
But then as you go posteriorly and looking at the floor of the cranial cavity, you see a bone that if you use your imagination looks perhaps like a butterfly with the wings here and the body here. Well that outline that's kind of butterfly-like that you're seeing is the sphenoid bone. Another cranial bone that causes problems again because of it, it's hard to see it, its real shape. But all the sphenoid bone extends all up in this aspect like this, giving it a butterfly shape, therefore forms part of the floor of the cranial cavity. Now, a couple of features that we can see from this view. An opening that I pass the probe in here, and likewise the same opening on the other side. This is the optic foramen. This same opening, if I put the probe there and then turn the skull around, you can see the probe coming into the orbit. This is where the optic nerve would pass from the eye into the cranial cavity on its way into the inside of the brain. You notice that that optic foramen is not only on the posterior aspect of the orbit, but it's also slightly medial. Something that you keep in mind if you're ever looking into a person's eyes with an ophthalmoscope and you're looking for the optic disc, which is where this nerve perforates the eyeball. Because when you look back into the eye, you not only look posteriorly, but you also look slightly medial in order to find that optic disc. Going back to the floor of the cranial cavity and seeing the sphenoid bone again, then this rather large depression here is called the sella tersica, which that term is derived from words meaning Turkish saddle. And I suppose if you use your imagination, that looks like a saddle that might be used uh, uh, on a camel perhaps, with the high horn and back and front. And in life, what is housed within this depression is the pituitary gland, which when we study the endocrine system, you'll see is a very vital piece of tissue of, uh, of the body. All the other openings that you see, which there's many, many of them, are all various different foramens that have specific names to them, which we're not studying them individually, but they're all either for the passage of cranial nerves out of the cranial cavity into head and neck structures, or for the passage of blood vessels to bring blood into the cranial cavity to nourish the brain and so forth. So every little hole and crevice and crease and so forth that you see does have some type of a purpose. And also, when you're looking into the floor of the cranial cavity, you'll notice that it's almost like looking at a fossilized imprint of the inferior surface of the brain. Because the brain was formed before the skull, and so the brain actually kind of serves as a mold for the bones of the cranial cavity. So as you look at the inner surface of the cranial cavity, you can actually pick out where the imprint of things like the temporal lobes of the cerebrum, the frontal lobes of the cerebrum, and the two lobes of the cerebellum have been located at, and so forth. All this is pretty much visible. You don't see it so much on these plastic skulls, but if you look at a, uh, uh, one of the real skulls, you can even see some imprints of some lines all along the inner surface of the bones. And those are the imprint from the blood vessels that nourish the meninges, meningeal arteries and meningeal veins and so forth. So the inside of the, uh, the cranial cavity. And since that sphenoid bone extends up like so, then if I put my finger here on the lateral side, then if we go to the other side, then this, why, this is why explains why in diagrams you also see a piece of the sphenoid bone extending up the side here because I'm just sitting on the other side of the bone. And that's also why if you see the inferior surface diagrams of the skull, you see pieces of sphenoid bone also because that bone is forming part of the floor of the cranial cavity. 